Okay, this will be part three of the War for America tutorial. We've already done most of the spring procedures and we'll probably begin with the action phases. But before we do that, I'm going to do a little bit of a historical diversion for a bit to show you um, the new rules that are coming into play here in 1776. A lot of concepts come in this year and there's a lot of moving parts and all these moving parts can change the outcome of your game so and again i may not be doing optimal play there's all kinds of strategies open but um let's pause for a moment and uh, let's look at some of these new rules now the militia rules are confusing a lot of new players and it's not all that complicated, but the rules are specific and there are limitations. Now, for example, in the spring of 1776, there shouldn't be any militia on the board because they've all been con uh, converted to continental regulars. But you must be cognizant of rule 10.7, which is grazing of militia if there are regions where British regulars are. And that is indeed the case here on the ground. I'll demonstrate. Now the only region on the board where we have British regulars and continental forces is in New England. This clump, you remember, Washington is besieging on the same square as Howe. So New England does qualify for Rule 10.7, which means the colonial player is going to roll for each colony in New England and raise his militia. Okay, I described the rules as having a lot of moving parts. Well, let's look at these moving parts, which come into play in 1776. Well, number one is Rule 10.7, which I've just pointed out. In regions where there are British regulars and colonials, 10.7 comes in, and militia will be raised in each colony. So that's one moving part. Okay, moving part number two. Another thing to remember are these very important loyalist chits. These are available to the British player, and he can play them anytime he wants to in his action pulse to raise militia in each region and they can add significantly to the size of the British Army. For example, look at the Loyalists that can be raised in the Middle States. 10 SP, Deep South 6, Tidewater 6, and New England only 2. So in theory, in theory only, if the British raised the Loyalists and got the maximums, he could release 24 SP of Loyalists. Now, I haven't seen that in any game but it shows you the potential. So don't ignore the loyalists. The key thing to use, uh, be cognizant of, is when to raise them. If you raise them too early, they'll be crushed by the Continentals. If you raise them too late, well, the British may be defeated in the area and the loyalists will be left to their own. So the timing of the loyalists is very critical. That's uh, moving part number two. Don't ignore the Loyalists. They're very important. Okay, another important moving part comes into play in 1776 of those pesky militia again. So you have to be aware of Rule 10.11, which states that if the British control a colony, no, colony, not region, and if they lose control of that colony, the militia are re-raised again in that colony. So, rule of thumb is British. Once you've controlled a colony, keep control of it. Because if you lose control of it, the militia are going to be re-raised in that colony. That's very important in the game. And a concept I think uh, a lot of players are perhaps missing. Another important moving part concerns the militia movement again. And you want to pay special attention to Rule 10.17, the second bullet. I think a lot of people think that militia are not allowed to leave their colony. 
That's not true. Nowhere in the rules do I say the militia cannot leave their colony. They can. So if you have some North Carolina militia here and you want to move it into Virginia, you're allowed to do so. But you have to obey the limitations of the militia maximums chart at all time. You can't go over. So if you move militia into Virginia, you have to make sure that you don't have more militia in Virginia than is possible. In this case, six. So the militia are fluid. So that's perfectly legal. Just be aware of the limitations of the militia though. I don't think I'm gonna see a scenario where you have militia from South Carolina marching up to Northern New York. Probably won't happen. But be aware of it. The militia is a little bit more mobile than players might think. Now let's get back to this historical digression a bit. And we'll do that so you can understand why I designed the game as I did. Now, most histories of the revolution concede that the turning point of the revolution was loss of Burgoyne's army here at Saratoga. It certainly was disastrous, and it's what triggered French entry into the war. And once the French get into the war, the British are probably going to lose. It was a turning point, no question about that. But many other really good histories of the revolution show that 1776 was almost as decisive, perhaps even more decisive than 1777. This is because if Washington's army had been trapped and destroyed at New York, God knows where the revolution would have occurred. Most historians agree that the small little affair at Trenton was a turning point. And let's face it, Trenton is what? a one strength point destroying a one strength point, but it had impact far beyond the size of the forces involved. So in 1776, in the game, any good game on the revolution, 1776 should be critical. And for several reasons. For one, the little innocuous battle of Valcour Island probably saved the colonial cause because Carleton, was unable to take Ticonderoga, or he did made no attempt to take Ticonderoga. And if they had done that, they would have been in a very good position for their spring campaign. So 1776 in this game, and many others I've played, is very, very critical. Because you've got Carleton and the reinforcements from England coming down the Lake Champlain corridor here. And if they break into the Hudson Highlands area, and with Howe down here in New York pushing up, you can almost isolate New England and probably deliver the knockout blow in 1776. So 1776 is going to be one rough year for the colonials. Now, when you start counting the factors on the board, like the Continentals, let's just do a, a quick count, see what they've got. Okay, so as I count them on the ground right now at this moment, in the spring of 1776, there are 32 combat factors of Continentals alone. How many British are there? There's six and two at Canada. That's eight. So the British are heavily outnumbered at the beginning of 1776. In real life, Howe's army was not concentrated till August of 1776. So most of the summer of 1776 is kind of lost, just gathering the forces together. Now, when Howe's forces come in, he finally will about equal Washington's forces. But not everything's going for the Americans either, the colonials at this time. Um, one, the Continentals are scattered. It's going to take a while to gather these into an army. The other little uh, thing you have to remember that in 1776 is we can create armies. And armies, as you'll see as we play, do have inherent advantages over just loose forces. You can use loose forces if you want, no problem. But in the end, it's armies that are going to decide the game. So, um, that's all I can say for now for the historical interlude. Ah yes, one more thing, and this is very important. I think a lot of players don't appreciate the advantage of the initiative. 
When you get the initiative and get back-to-back -back turns, that can be gold. And in the spring here of 1776, I'm going to show you why this is extra critical. Now over here at Boston, we've got Howe besieged, or virtually besieged, at Boston with eight combat factors. And Washington has in the immediate vicinity uh, only five. But he can call in these others. He also can create an army. What if Washington gets the initiative first and he creates an army? Only an army can besiege a place. So if Washington goes first, and if he wants to create an army, which would be a good idea to do, he can do so. Then in his next action pulse, he can lay siege to Howe, and then Howe is caught with his back to the sea, which brings in that other very important moving part I didn't discuss. And that's the naval transport capacity for the British. For 1776, it's only six. Yes, that means only six SP can move by sea for the entire year. You see, it took nearly all the resources of the British Navy and the private sector to get Howe's army to North America. It was the largest British army ever dispatched to a foreign land. And it took everything they've got. All the transportation uh, was used to get Howe's army and the other forces there. There was none left over for amphibious operations. That's why this number is so low. So you have to treat that like gold. Well, you say, well, who cares? Howe's got his back to the sea. He can just move by water. Uh, yeah, but what if he blows all of his transport capacity, which is only six? He's in a very dire situation. So who moves first in the spring is going to make a big difference. So there's a, an amazing little chess game here. And it's no accident that I'm kind of recreating what really happened uh, in real life. Now, in the actual campaign, how, with sort of an agreement with Washington's um, agreement, uh, evacuated Boston and went to Halifax. Now, in the game, well, you could do that. Blow your transport capacity and go to Halifax, or you could actually move overland to Newport. There's going to be lots of strategies here, and there's a whole, whole sub-game going on here. And when the time comes and Carleton begins to move down, you've got some important things here happening in the fall of 1776, if we even get that far. I don't know if the Americans are going to be able to stop the British from coming down. And those lake navies, yeah, two counters. Laughable, aren't they? But believe me, that one little lake counter can do a lot of damage. Damage in the respect that it closes the strategy. The only way to get into New York is down the Richelieu. And if the British have a navy here at, let's say, Northumberland, or, or pardon me, St. Jean, they block the Americans. They just block them. The only way then up is the Mohawk Valley. Conversely, if the colonials have a Lake Navy at Ticonderoga or Valcour, and the British do not, any British force is blocked from going south too. So those two little Lake Navies, as simple as those counters may seem, could mean a lot in your game. There's a lot of strategy in this game. But without further ado, let's go to the action phase and learn how to play this game in 1776, a very important year. Okay, before we can go to the action phase, we still have to clean up this loyalist and militia muster because of that awkward situation in Boston. So the colonials are gonna roll for each individual colony in New England. Let's begin with New Hampshire. They roll and they get a one which is the worst they could have got, which is no militia. In other words, New Hampshire did not rise to the call. No militia raised. Okay, now we're going to roll for Massachusetts. And they get a five. And that's full SP. So we look up Massachusetts, New England. They're allowed to have six. So they get six militia in Massachusetts. Okay, so we're going to be playing, uh, placing six militia in Massachusetts. Remember the militia maximums per space. The most they can put is four. You say, well, I'm just going to put them on top of Washington. 
Nope, can't do that. It's because the British are technically in control of Boston. Why are they in control, you say? Well, when both parties are on the square, the default control is British when it's a seaport, which Boston is. So you cannot put any militia on Washington's space. He can move them in later on, but they just can't appear there. So I think the best thing to do would put, uh, we'll put four militia here at Worcester and uh, yeah, two over here at Northfield. So you can see Washington's force now has been seriously augmented. Now we're supposed to roll for Rhode Island, but no militia can come on there because Rhode Island is in British control. So all we're rolling for now is Connecticut. Roll for Connecticut, and they get a six, which is the full amount. And Connecticut can also raise six militia. So we're gonna place six militia in Connecticut. Okay, well, I'll put four here at New London and two here at Hartford. So all of the militia for the region of New England have been raised. Now this is very important. Okay, now this is very important. Because we have raised all of the militia in a region, New England, we're gonna take one of these regional markers here and put it on the board, on the militia. That's to remind us that that is a one-time event. In the entire game, that will never happen again. You will never re-raise the militia by region. From then on, it's only by colony. Remember, if the British lose control of a colony, the militia can come back. But regionally, that only happens once. And with that, we're now ready to roll for initiative to see who goes first. And as you can see, the colonials are all over the place. And poor old Howe has his back to the sea. Let's roll and see who moves first for the spring time turn of 1776. Okay, we're rolling now and let's see what happens. Aha, the colonials move first. This could get ugly. Okay, we move the action pulse marker down one notch to remind us that the colonials are going first and also put the initiative marker here. Now, there's a whole host of options for the colonials. And again, in my game, it might be different than yours. You might try a different strategy. But here's some options. One, does Washington have five strength points? Yes, he does. So he could create an army in that square, and that's highly desirable. Another thing, too, would be to start gathering these continentals and reinforce Washington. That's going to take time. The colonials also could draw one of these leaders, or leaders and activate these colonials. Remember when you pull a leader from the leader pool, you don't have to roll for activation. It counts as your activation, but uh, you don't have to roll for it. And of course, there's this little wee uh, campaign in the south still going on. But if I was the colonial player, I'd be watching the north because Carleton with these British reinforcements is gonna come out of Canada like a storm. So um, I don't know. I personally think that Washington should try to drive Howe out of Boston. But um, let me think about it and we'll come up with a move. Yes, I think the best thing the colonists can do is to make an army before the British do. So army creation is rule 11.20. And there's six qualifications to make an army, and Washington qualifies for all six. So, what you do when you make an army is you take the units off the board, and you put them over there on the army markers. I'll show that in a second. Okay, what you do is you take the Washington, put him in that box to show it's Washington's army. Any other leaders with him should go beside him and then put your forces here. And you'll see the advantages of an army later on. But that's how you place an army. Then you take one of these army markers. I've made these little wooden ones, but the game comes with uh, cardboard pieces. But um, we put Washington's army there on Boston.
No, he's not besieging Boston yet. There's not a siege marker on. Because that takes an entire turn. It takes your whole pulse just to create that army. But it's well worth it. So that's the colonial turn. Now the action pulse for the British. Okay, the British have some very dire problems. Remember I told you a rule of thumb, though, is... It's not a rule, it's just a rule of thumb. Always a good idea to get your reinforcements in first. Then you know what your forces on the ground can do. So we've got some two forces there, Cornwallis and uh, a fleet and some troops, and we've got Rita Zell and Simon. So let's get those on the board first. Okay, we're rolling for the Burgoyne Rita Zell Fraser Force in Europe, and their destination is Quebec. Roll the die, and they get a five, which is more than enough to land at Quebec. So one and two. Now remember reinforcements, when they land, have one movement point left. So they could move one more square and attack this Frontenac force at Trois-Rivières. Now that's a respectable force. That's five Continentals under Gates. So doing the math overall, Gates would be adding, well, he's the senior commander, so you can't use uh, Arnold. Okay, doing the math, Gates would be on the three to seven table adding one, because he's a C-class C leader. Why can't he add Arnold? Well, because he's the senior, and it's not an army, which is another reason for making armies. If you had an army, Arnold could be used. Now, Burgoyne and Fraser, Rita Zell, they're all equal rank. Burgoyne is not the army commander at this time. So we could use Fraser in the battle because all of them are two star. So they'd be on the 8 to 14 table, adding two. But they have to minus one for uh, Gates's entrenchment. So they'd be on a better table, adding one. It's an iffy battle. And it would be nice to push the Americans out of Trois-Rivières. But, on the other hand, Gates could win. And that would certainly be embarrassing for the British just upon landing to lose a battle. So I'm not going to attack in this case. Not a good idea to always just rush off the boats and go in. Maybe that's a mistake. But with hindsight, we'll never know if they would have won the battle. So Burgoyne will halt at Quebec. Okay, we have yet to roll for Cornwallis. Now, historically, he went down to Charleston, but that didn't turn out too good. And right now, I don't think the British really bother much about the South. The situation at Boston is they're just, it's awful. So I think Cornwallis, he won't sail to Boston. He'll sail to uh, Newport. Let's roll and see what he gets. He has four moving points. So he should have no trouble getting to Newport. So we go one and two. And we've got Cornwallis with three more strength points at Newport. Cornwallis is an A-class leader, by the way, and another fleet. Okay. Now we have the uh, Mr. Howe at Boston. Well, I think he's got absolutely only one option. He doesn't want to blow all his transport capacity by pulling out by transport. And besides, his transport capacity is six, and I believe he's got more than there. Yeah, he'd have to leave a couple of guys behind, and that's not good. So, it's not yet a siege. So how is going to roll his initiative and just leave the square. He can do that because it's not a siege yet. He can just march over land to Newport. Rolling for Howe's initiative, he rolls a five, which is, uh, it means he fails his initiative, but you get two moon points anyway. So Howe just leaves, abandons his entrenchments, and marches to Newport. Now notice, because of that, he was unable to make an army. He's just a big force. 
There's not the advantage of an army yet. So Washington has the initiative and the British are on the run. Not an enviable situation to be in. Actually, I think the British will do one more thing before ending their pulse. Remember, you can play an action card at any time. And Howe is going to need every single advantage that he can muster. So he's going to play the Patrick Ferguson card. He's a loyalist tactical leader. And we'll add Patrick Ferguson tactical leader to that loyalist on that stack. And then that will end the British pulse. Rolling again for the next critical action pulse. The Americans will go first again. But once again, be ugly. Let's see what happens. This time, the British move first. So they have a little bit of a respite. So we switch these around, move the action pulse marker down. What are the British going to do this turn? Okay, the logical thing to do for Howe is to create an army. It would be senseless to do anything else. Because with an army, he'll be able to take advantage of all that great leadership in there, adding many to the dice. He's entrenched at Newport. Um, it just makes sense to make an army. He qualifies for those um, six qualifiers. And uh, so we'll create the Royal Army at Newport under Howe. Now you can place the men on the army cards, whatever way you like. But I find the most beneficial way is to put the senior commander on the left, the subordinate commanders to the right, the strength points, and any tactical leaders. But like I said, you can put them any way you like. The nice thing about using the army counters, it cuts down on counter clutter on the game. You'll see what I mean in a moment. As you can see, once you consolidate the army into one counter, it's a lot easier and uh, counter clutter is greatly reduced. Now I might point out that, um, let's look at the math if Howe's army was attacked. So let's look at the math. And he's got a fort on that square too. So two of those strength points would be doubled. So two of them would be, you know, doubled to four. And then he'd have, what, 11 plus what, 15. He'd be adding three for Howe to the dice. He's allowed to pick one subordinate, which is Cornwallis, adding another three. So he's adding six to the dice. He's got Ferguson as a tactical leader, so he's adding seven to the dice. So that would be a mighty mean force to attack. Now Washington can get his factors in there too. And, uh, you know, it's still iffy. The dice are fickle. But I'd think twice before attacking a force like that. Anyway, that's the British turn. Okay, that was the British turn. Now the Colonials can move. Now they, they, they've got a whole host of options. But I don't think Washington wants to go trouncing off to Rhode Island and trying to um, knock Howe out of there. I think that would be a bit dangerous. Especially since in the north, now Carleton has this whole force consolidated. And Carleton is an army commander. So if Carleton makes an army and starts moving down the Richelieu, uh, Gates is going to be a busy man. So Gates might be a good idea to get Gates moving or entrenched or fall back to Ticonderoga or activate Schuyler down there at uh, New York or activate one of those many leaders there and get some reinforcements up to Gates. Uh, Washington himself is only a six, so I don't know. Um... If Howe started to come out of Newport, it could get ugly too. So you should always feed your armies. Look at the militia around there too. I mean, Washington's forces, once you got that consolidated, it could be pretty ugly. But I am concerned for Gates. From experience, I know that if the British get rolling in the north, uh, they'll have no trouble pushing you back. So I'm going to give some attention to Gates this time. Now, one, two, three, four... He could be at Saratoga. That's almost too far. I think I'm going to activate another leader, Benjamin Lincoln, and reinforce Gates. Of course, could make Gates an army too. Yeah, I think that's even better. He's got five strength points. 
and he's in supply. Three, four, five, six, yeah. Yeah, Gates is gonna make the Northern Army at Trois-Rivières. Okay, you can see the war in the North has changed considerably. With Gates now in command of an army, still only five Continentals, but he, he can now add Arnold in, and he's entrenched. So, you know, let's say he was to attack, he'd be adding four to the dice. And in defense, he still could be a very tough nut to crack. So that's the situation up there in the north with Gates, with the Northern Army at Trois-Rivières. Okay, we're going for initiative again. Third initiative. And the Colonials go first. An observation for this game, um, we've hardly seen any tie die rolls, which is a little unusual. In playtesting, we saw all kinds of tie die rolls, which of course made the game turn shorter and the players recycled more cards. That's not happening so far in this game. Maybe that will change. Anyway, move the action pulse marker down and the Colonials will take their turn. Okay, the Colonials have stabilized the situation pretty well now, so maybe it's time to consolidate and get Washington's army really, really formidable, or get these Continentals up from the south. Um, I think right now the militia is in the immediate vicinity. Of course, they can't exceed the militia maximums, can they, if uh, Washington stays in uh, New England? He's already at the maximum. Hmm. Well, no, I think we'll get the Continentals up to Washington as fast as we can. Now, Schuyler's down there, but we might as well pick a new leader, activate him, and uh, then you don't have to roll to see if uh, he moves. So I'll pick uh, Lincoln, and I'll put him on maybe the largest stack of Continentals. Yeah, this one at there, four, and uh, he'll activate. And let's gather up some men. He can, yeah, he can go there. Actually, he just pulls him in. You can muster. Oh, wait, the muster might be an entire action. I'll have to check that myself. Okay, the way I wrote the rule, I did not say that it burns up your entire action. So, Lincoln, uh, we're losing that focus again. Well, anyway, Lincoln will pull this unit in, like so and then move and pick up these forces at Trenton. So that cost him nothing. One, two, pick them up, no cost. Three and four. So Lincoln is on the move with a nice formidable force of Continentals. And that's the Colonial Pulse. Okay, the British have a bit of a breather now. We can now look at Carleton's, uh, well, the most logical thing is to have Carleton form an army too. So I'll do that right now. Okay, that was a simple move. We just put all of Carlton's forces on the Canada Army card and created the army at Canada at Quebec. When you create an army, that's your entire action pulse. So we're now rolling for the last action pulse of the turn, which was early spring 1776. Roll, no tie still. And the uh, Colonials are moving first. Again, last action pulse of the turn. Well, having started north, I could continue to move Benjamin Lincoln to Washington or else have Washington just leave Boston and march on Lincoln because um, he wants to stay in the vicinity. He actually could pick up some militia along the way too. Yeah, that's what he'll do. We'll activate Washington, pick up some militia, and consolidate at New Haven. And that will make Washington's army pretty, pretty formidable. Washington nearly always moves, but if he rolls a six, we have to roll again. Rolling, he rolls a three, so Washington activates. So he's going to go here, one, to New Haven, then two, no, New London, and then to New Haven, picking up this four militia. So I can consolidate this whole shebang into Washington's army, at New Haven, and that's gonna be pretty formidable. Okay, Washington's army is now 13 Continentals and four militia, and he has two leaders. So he's a force to be reckoned with, that's for sure. So the British will finish the turn by taking their last action pulse, and that will end the turn. Maybe it's time to look at 
Carlton up in Canada again. What can you bring to bear against Gates? Looking quickly at the map, Carlton could only bring to bear eight regulars, but he'd be adding five to the dice because of his loyalists and his tactical leaders. Gates would be adding four to the dice, and it would actually cause Carlton to minus one. But I hate to be intimidated by Gates sitting at Trau Riviere. I think Carlton is going to try it. I wish there was a card he could use. I think that battle card may be handy now, but uh, no, I think it's time for a big battle at Trau Riviere. Of course, Gates might retreat too. So let's activate Carlton, roll the die, see if he activates. Gets a four, Carlton activates. So he's gonna move the entire army, except for one British regular, to Trau Riviere. Now Gates has the decision whether to contest Carlton's advance or retreat. And I think Gates has had enough of retreating, so we're gonna have our big battle there at Trau Riviere. Let's do the math and roll some dice. Okay, it's a pretty swingy combat, slightly in the British favor. Carlton will end up on the eight to 14 table, adding four to the dice. Gates will be on the five table, three to seven table, and adding four to the dice. So we'll roll the dice and see what happens. And no battle cards will help in this case. So away we go. Roll the dice for the battle at Trois Riviere. Roll the dice for the battle at Trois Riviere. Whoa, not good. Okay, Gates rolled a three. And the British rolled a five. But the five becomes a nine, so Carlton has inflicted a one two star result. And Gates. Got a seven, which is a one result. So they each lost one step, except that Gates must retreat. Now losses in this game have to be taken in a strict order. And for the British, the first strength quit lost must be six nations, not applicable here. And the second must be a regular unit. So Carlton must remove one regular unit. So we'll replace that three and put a British two there. The Colonials' first loss must be Six Nations and then also a regular unit. So Gates would take off that five unit and replace it with a four unit. Now Gates must retreat, which in this game is simply one hex, nothing too serious. He retreats from Trauber every year, and he has a choice of going to St. Jean or Montreal. I think he'll take St. Jean, the only Richelieu, to block Carlton. Now, he's marked with a D marker. Now, that's normally not too serious unless you're attacked again with a back to back move. But since we're on the last action pulse and the turn's over, that's no worry for Gates. So that ends the 1776 early spring turn. Now it's very early because the British surge has yet to come with lots of British reinforcements. But the situation is stabilized. Washington's got a nice, good continental army backed by militia. Howe's got a good army and Carlton has a good army. So things are shaping up for a hot fight. That's the end of that turn. Now, I like to keep these videos short if possible, so I probably clocked in enough time there. So, we'll end it right now, the early spring turn of 1776. So, we'll begin with the late spring, and uh, let's do a preview of what comes in. Late spring, yeah. Howe's fleet comes in, Grant and 10 more British, Niephausen and 10 Germans. So, things begin to heat up pretty quick in the late spring. The colonies, uh, colonials, they only get leader green, so they have plenty of leadership. So I'll end the video now, and I hope you're enjoying the series. Thank you for watching.